Hey, I want to tell you a true story. Uh, when I was in high school, way back when, a buddy of mine, we're at the store, we went to the mall, and we're at the store, and last minute decision, I decided to buy the girl that I'm dating some twist beads. Now, this is in the 80s. Any ladies in here remember twist beads? Okay, we okay. We got one. I got. I see that hand. Praise God. I see that hand. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, there's a hand right there. So anyway, apparently it was popular with a few people in the in the 80s, you know. And so I decided to buy this. Now I'm probably 16, 17 years old, and we're at one of the anchor stores in the mall, like a Lord and Taylor, a Riches, or a Macy's, or something like that. And so finally, I decided to, to make the purchase, and I walk up to the makeup counter, jewelry counter, wherever you, you know, you check out at one of those, you know, nicer stores. And the lady that's walking up to me looks at me. And then she looks at the other clientele who are, you know, middle-aged or older ladies with, with money. And she looks at me wearing like a Panama Jack t-shirt and shorts and, you know, tennis shoes. And she does it. She goes to them. I will never forget that feeling the way she treated me, okay? I mean, it it was unbelievable how she treated me. And I I had money. I worked at Piggly Wiggly. I made $3.35 an hour plus tips. I was getting ready to throw down 20 bucks on these twist beads. But yet she she chose uh, to help the wealthy customers. There was a a contrast in, in how I looked compared to how they looked. And there was a stark contrast in how she treated me versus how she treated other people. We're in Psalm 37. We're doing a series, if you're new with us today, uh, uh, Summer in the Psalms. And we're in Psalm 37. And we've been looking at the wicked and, and the godly. And it really starts out, hey, don't fret about the wicked. Don't worry about them. You know, let, just wait on God to handle the wicked. And you're going to see in this Psalm how God handles the wicked. You're going to see a stark contrast of how the godly behave and how the wicked behave. You're going to see a stark contrast on how God treats the godly versus how God treats the wicked. And so let's go ahead and and, and get into the scripture. Listen, Listen to this contrast. He says the wicked borrow and they never repay. And you're going, I got family like that, right? But the godly are generous givers. The wicked borrow, they never repay but the godly are generous givers. Those the Lord blesses will possess the land. That's covenant language. The original hearers here, the, the Jewish people, they knew that one day they, they would possess this land. It's full of milk and honey. All their provisions would be taken care of. We know that's covenant language. We know as believers we have more than that, that one day we will inherit the whole earth and every need we have is taken care of in Christ. But those he curses will die. The wicked being served justice. Now, we don't celebrate that, but there's justice here. The Lord directs the steps of the godly, and he delights in every detail of their lives. I want you to be encouraged this morning. There's several pictures in this scripture we're going to walk through, but I'm going to tell you something. The Lord delights in every detail of our lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall. Here's another picture. For the Lord upholds them by his hand. Once I was young, David says, and now I'm old. He's writing this. If you're new today, he's writing this at the end of his life. And it's like he's preparing this uh, for, for his son Solomon. Once I was old, young, and now I'm old. Yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. The godly always give generous loans to others, and their children are a blessing. Sometimes you can read scripture like this, and for some of us, you're wondering, which side am I on? Am I going to be treated like the godly, or am I going to be treated like the wicked? I'm not sure, you may be thinking, what side do I fall on? And you know what? We can be pretty hard on ourselves. I mean, we can be so self-condemning. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can be so self-condemning. I, insecurity can, can run rampant. But I love what Paul says. There is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. 
I want us to look at how God treats his people. And really, so by the end of the message, I hope you know, and I hope you're encouraged that you know Christ. And if you don't know Christ, man, I hope you'll decide that today. So here's how God treats his people, all right? If you're in his, if you're one of his people, here's how he treats you. We're blessed with God's perfect provision. Listen, we're blessed not with good provision. We're not not blessed, hey, I'll take care of you. Yeah, just move on. No, we're blessed with God's perfect provision. It says in in Psalm 37, the wicked borrow and they never repay, but the godly are generous givers. Those the Lord blesses will possess the land and those he curses will die. First contrast, wicked borrow, they never repay. Man, the godly are generous. Now, let me say this. It's not wrong to borrow money, but it is wrong to borrow money knowing you're not going to repay it. Okay? I don't think anybody in here is borrowing money going, I'm never going to repay this. Man, that's what, that's what the wicked do. Godly people have borrowed money and they pay it back. The godly, though, are not always necessarily wealthy. They're just generous. The godly are generous most often when they have very little to give, and they're able to give. You know why they're able to give? Because the Lord has provided for them perfectly. Now, here's this observation that David makes. Once I was young, and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. Sometimes you read a certain scripture. Now, some of you may remember Arsenio Hall. There are some things that just make you go, hmm, you know, because if you think about it, is that statement true? Now, there's a difference between a a rule and and a truth. I mean, a, a truth applies to everyone everywhere, but a rule applies most of the time. Let's talk about Georgia football for a second. Why do you assume it's negative? As a rule... Georgia's going to have a good season. They're going to be 10-2 and two, as a rule, right? As a rule. That's granted, okay? I get, Trey nodded his head. I'm okay now, all right? As a rule. Hey, as a rule, Alabama's going to make it to the playoffs, right? A, a, you can say it if it's as a rule. It doesn't mean you're pulling for them. Man, y'all are prideful. I'm telling you, <laughs> prideful. As a rule, the SEC dominates college football. Right Now, as a Clemson fan, that is hard for me to say. But as a rule, it's true. As a rule, godly people and their kids are taken care of. They do not go without. That is as a rule. But what does every rule have? Every rule has exceptions to the rule. The Apostle Paul is an exception to this rule. Man, if you read about his life and you read about his ministry and you read about how he suffered for Christ, this is what Paul says in his own words. I've been hungry and I've been thirsty and I've often gone without food and I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Man, greatest apostle in my mind. Going without. I wonder, you know, he knew this psalm. He, he, it's not like he's quite, hey God, where, where's mine? Where, where's my food? Where, where's my clothing? Where's my shelter? Why is this happening? But, but you read it, you read through Acts. Man, Paul had just set his face to serving the Lord. When he knows the truth or the rule that David talks about, the question is, why would he keep going? Man, why would Paul keep going and be hungry? Why would uh, Paul keep going and be cold and and, and face the the, the whippings and face the imprisonment and face uh, the the conditions of the weather? Why would he keep going? Because we know Paul was known to suffer greatly for Christ. How does he do that? Why and how and, and even thrive? Because here's the truth for all, for all people. Paul knew something. Paul had tasted something better than bread. Paul had, had experienced Christ. Here, here's what Jesus said. Jesus himself says this in John 6, 35. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again, will never thirst again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty, he says. See, Paul experienced something greater than anything the earth could ever provide. 
And you know what? This is true for whoever. This, this is not a rule. This, this is a truth. Whoever trusts in Jesus, man, they, they will taste and experience something this world cannot offer. It is Christ himself. They will never be spiritually hungry again. They will never be spiritually thirsty again. There is a satisfaction that comes from knowing Christ that trumps any physical desire or need. And this satisfaction, it comes from walking with Jesus. This this satisfaction that, that endures these horrific conditions comes from obeying Jesus. This, this satisfaction is only found in Christ. And Paul knew it. And Paul tasted it. Paul experienced it. Being one with Him. Surrendering to His will daily. It's a joy. It's, it's full of peace. It's, it's certainty. It's, it's hopeful. And it creates a type of day And I'm not saying Paul didn't struggle. I'm not saying Paul didn't have his moments. But man, when when your satisfaction, your your provision is Christ, and it creates a day, it's like, I wonder what God's going to do today. Man, I've laid out my prayer request. I wonder what he's going to do today. Or I wonder what kind of encounters he's going to give me today to share his name. To minister to somebody. To love someone. To promote and honor the name of Christ. Paul tasted it. Yeah, it's a rule. I'm going to taste it. It is a rule. And and I've seen a lot of generous people taken care of. Uh, Matter of fact, I feel like some of the healthiest people I know are not the wealthiest. They're just the most generous. And you know what? And it does. It seems like, you know what? It seems like their shoes last longer. It seems like everything goes well for them. There's a blessing there. But it's a rule. But what's true is whoever trusts in Jesus, man, they will never, their soul will never hunger and thirst again. And there's a joy there. So Paul experienced this joy of knowing Christ, but he also experienced this. If there's even more blessing and it gets richer, Jesus uh, explained it this way when he's he's at the well and the the woman's there at the well and everybody's hungry disciples leave to go get food and they come back and jesus talked to a woman and she's got a pass and they're sort of shocked and they're just shocked he's talking to this woman and then they're thinking did somebody bring him food you know and here's what he says now my nourishment comes from doing the will of god but these guys were physically hungry And you know what he says? My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me. And my nourishment comes from finishing his work. There's a satisfaction. There's a nourishment. There's a provision. And not just in knowing Christ, but doing the work that Christ has called us to do. And Paul knew this and he experienced it and he tasted it. And that's why he kept going. Listen to his words. He says, my life is worth nothing to me unless I finish the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others. The work of telling others. My iPad's jacked up now. I'm sorry, y'all. The work of telling others. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Paul knew Christ. And Paul said, you know what's even better than food? You know what's even better than water? Listen, everybody needs it to live. It's walking with Jesus and doing what Jesus has called him to do. It's why he doesn't go back to what it was like before. Like the Israelites, when they were removed from Egypt. Remember, things got tough. And what do they want to do? Hey, take us back to slavery. Well, that's why Paul didn't go back. That's why he didn't go back to just being like he was before. That's why he just didn't make tents full time and forget the gospel. That's why I'm still here and I didn't go back to work for Coca-Cola so I could buy Twisted Beads. Following Jesus doesn't always end up in a career-changing life. But it's always surrender and there's always obedience. And I'm going to tell you what's always on the other side of obedience is joy. And there's Always on the other side of obedience of following Jesus, there is incredible joy. 
So God provides us with the bread of life. He provides us with Jesus, but He also provides us with a mission that is far more satisfying than food and shelter. You know what it is? I, some of y'all were telling me about situations sort of like this this morning. It's when you tell other people about Jesus. It's, or it's when you give out a bottle of water in the name of Jesus. It's, it's when you get to serve and, and do an event for maybe the ladies' ministry and, and people that are disconnected get connected and they get loved on. Otherwise, they'd be out, like, out there like a spiritual orphan. Man, it's telling others about you. It's inviting other people into your small group. It's small groups taking care of one another. It's, it's being the church in a lost world. And we're going to talk more about that in the next coming weeks. But God provides us with perfect provision. But we're also blessed with God's perfect protection. Now, let's go back between the, the contrast between the, the godly and the wicked. Now, remember, the wicked will die. Man, we, we, you and I know what that means. That's not just a physical death, but that's in, because we know the New Testament. That's a spiritual death. That's eternity in hell. But not so the godly. He says this in Psalm 37, 23 and 24. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. Here's a picture I want you to get. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they will stumble, they will not fall because he holds them by the hand. The wicked... They're going to die one day. And they will be no more. But look at this picture. He delights. The, the word literally implies he bends down and delights. I've got a new grandbaby. She's um, a couple weeks old. And I tell you what's more fun than having a grandbaby is watching my kids with their new daughter. And let me tell you what they do. Man, she's in her little um, bouncy seat. I don't even know if you call it a bouncy seat anymore. But uh, she's in there. I mean, they're just like this. I'm going to tell you, she can do no wrong. And she looks like a, she was a C-section. So, and now I'm giving out details. I may not be able to, should not be able to give out. But anyway, I'm doing it. Granddaddy. All right. She's like a little baby doll. Her, her head's perfect. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not showing preference or anything like that. But just tiny. She was, she was. Five weeks premature. She's just got perfect fingers and perfect tails, but, but my son holds her. And I said, you know, one day you're going to have to discipline her. He said, mm. <laughs> Here's what you and I know. Terrible twos, they're coming, right? They're coming. But they right now delight in her. I want you to know the love that God has for you. He delights in you. You're going, no, 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 I can't. Yeah, he does. He delights in you. Bent over, enjoying you. Terrible twos. We sort of go through those, don't we? God has seen us in our terrible twos, our terrible 20s, our terrible 30s, our foolish 40s. And listen, we're not perfect. And yes, we, we still sin. Listen to this next picture. Though they stumble, he says they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. The Lord does not come back later and pick you up. He never lets you go. You've got a Father in heaven, if you've trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, who is delighting in you, directing your steps, delighting in you. And though you may stumble, though you may sin, He's not going to let you fall away. He's going to hold you by the hand. Not let you go. So you won't fall away. Does sin grieve God? Yes. 
It does. Is, is sin wrong? Yes, it is. Does he quit on us? Never. Never. You didn't quit on your two-year-old. If you had one, you, you didn't quit. God never lets go and quits. He protects us from the punishment that the ungodly, that those, he, those that are cursed, those that are going to die, he protects us from that. That's the kind of protection that unbelievers will experience. Listen to what it says in Jude. He says, not only will he keep us from falling away, he says, now all glory to God who's able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy. Now this is God. He's going to bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. You go, wow. But I've already got these faults. No, Kurt said earlier, all your sins, all your future sins are forgiven in Christ Jesus. All glory to Him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are His before all time and in the present and beyond all time. One day you and I will see Jesus face to face. One day you and I will see Him eyeball to eyeball. And what we believed in our heart we will see with our eyes. And what we slightly, slightly tasted, man, will be the norm in day in and day out for eternity. And sin, that stumbling, that'll be gone forever. No temptation. Some of you are still beating yourself up about what you did last night or what you said or what you looked at. And some are beating yourself up not from last night, but maybe a week ago or a month ago or maybe 20 years ago or maybe from when you were in high school. Can I tell you what Jesus is wanting to do? He's wanting to erase that. He just wants you to do that. Hey, just tell him about it. Confess it to him. You know what? He's faithful and just. He will purify you. Not wipe you off and leave a residue. No, he will purify you from all sin. And he wants you to walk in his grace, not in your condemnation. He wants you to walk in the truth. And that you are loved, that you are forgiven, that, you, that God delights in you, and that He is holding you by the hand, and He will not let you fall away. He wants you to see Him as a parent that is doting over you. Now, does God discipline? Yes, God disciplines. You know what? I'm thankful my parents discipline. I'm thankful God disciplines me so that I can know Him even greater. But he wants us to walk in his grace and not in his condemnation. Because there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So some of you, you know what camp you're in. And you know you're not perfect, but because of Christ, man, you can enjoy the Father and the blessings of the Father. His perfect provision, his perfect protection. Some of you don't know. Man, you, you've been through a whole service. And we have sung songs about Jesus. We have had communion. And we talked about the work of, of the cross. And maybe you realize you've not crossed the line. Yeah, can, I, can I tell you what Paul said? Hey, hey, what are you waiting for? Paul said, what are you waiting for? Hey, get up and, and, and be baptized. H have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. Like if you don't know today, I'm telling you the father that I've described in this message and in this psalm. Listen, he wants to delight in you. And he wants you to know that he is your father and you are his child. So call on the name of the Lord today. For all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So you only you know if He's been drawing you in. And enjoy the, the freedom of Christ. And enjoy the blessing of, of God's presence. Enjoy God's grace. So why are we blessed? And why, why are we blessed? Why are we blessed with perfect, perfect provision? Why are we blessed with, with perfect protection? Listen, we're blessed, and you've heard this before. We're blessed in order to be a blessing. 
Listen, we are blessed in order to be a blessing. The godly are generous givers. So um, that, that's not just talking about tithing. I want to talk about physical giving real quick because I don't want to get away from that. It's not just talking about giving to the church, but it's also giving to those in the church. It's giving to those in need. And listen, you know what? Just like you are faithful to give to the church, man, you are faithful to give to those in need. But it's not just from the rich. It's it's from everyone. Rich and, and poor. The most generous person isn't the one with the most money. The most generous person is the one who's just willing to give out of what they have. And I want to challenge you. Man, look around you and give. Look around you and and continue to give. Give give out of your garden. Give out of your pantry. Give out of your checkbook. Don't give off your credit card. I don't want to tell you to do that. But give. And don't overthink it. Any overthinkers in here? If I give this, maybe it's um, maybe I'm hindering God's work, and you know, or, or man, if I do that, man, I, well, I, want, I don't want them to have too much, because then that might lead to something else. I can overthink something to death. Don't overthink it, man. You see a need, just give towards it. Listen, it says in Psalm 37, the godly always give generous loans. A better translation is they lend freely to others, and their children will be a blessing. Church, we should set the example in this. Paul says this in, in, in Acts. He said, you know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who were with me. I've been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So Paul, and he set the example in it. But remember what his mission was. It was to complete the mission of telling the world about Jesus. So yeah, give. Man, help people. Man, give. You see somebody in need, you hear about somebody in need, yeah, give. But you know what? Don't forget the greatest gift you have to give, the way we need to be the most generous, is telling other people about what Jesus has done for us. Telling other people about who Jesus is and how much he loves them. Tell people about what Jesus has done for you. Listen, we, we, the people of God, are blessed. He delights in us. He holds us by the hand. He's provided perfectly for us, for both provision and protection. I hope today that you know how blessed you are by God. I hope today that you know how much God loves you. I hope today you know that we are blessed And I hope you know this. I hope you know this. Man, God is for you. Uh, Understand this. He he is for you. He's not against you. He doesn't look at you and and, and go to to, to tend to help somebody that's more promising or, or, or seems to be more faithful. No, He is for you. He delights in you. Man, He He bends down to enjoy you. Man, God is for you. So let, let's stand. And I want to give you just an opportunity here. I, I, I want to give you an opportunity to praise Him. I want to give you an opportunity to think about how blessed we are. This song we're going to sing, man, talks about the blessing. But I want to give you an opportunity too. Maybe today you, you need to cross the line. Man, I'm going to be down here. Man, I would love to pray with you or answer any questions that you have. Or maybe today you just want to pray. Maybe you got somebody on your mind that needs to know about Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to pray for boldness in order to share Christ. I tell you, let's do this. Let's stand. Let's praise him. And if you want to pray or you'd like for somebody to pray with you, I'll be down here.